percolate the ground I just want to make you smile I don't care who tries to calm me down I don't care who's a right or wrong I just want to praise you You covered me in the midst of it all. You loved me and gave me another chance. You saw my needs when others saw my faults. You forgave me. I don't have to listen for my name They don't have to walk me down the aisle I just want to make you proud Should I make the Hall of Fame Or they save me a special seat I just hope that you'll be pleased You covered me in the midst of it all You loved me And gave me another chance You rescued me When I was gonna fall, gonna fall You loved me So in my life We yeah, yeah. In my life, in my life, be glorified. You get the glory, you get the praise, you take the honor. I just want to say that you get the glory, Father, you get the praise, take all of the honor. I just want to say you get the glory, Father, you get the praise, you take the honor. I just want to say you the glory you get the praise take all of the honor I just want to say I come back to say thank you Lord thank you Lord for everything you've done I come back to
Amen. Amen. You get the honor. You get the glory. Amen. Amen. I got to tell you this week, I was blessed by listening to Amanda Gorman's over and over again. I listened to that, and it took me to a place that we did not even realize how deep it was. And so I want to take you to part of that journey this week and this morning. And I'll take you to the book of Jonah, first chapter. And it reads like this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against because its wickedness has come before the Lord. But Jonah ran away, headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying his fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and a violent storm arose, and the ship was threatened to break apart. All the sailors were afraid and cried out to their God and threw the cargo into the sea to lighten up the ship. But Jonah had gone down to the deck, and he laid down, and he had a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice on us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots and find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us. Who is responsible for making the trouble? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I'm Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, Well, what have you done? For they knew he was running from the Lord, because he had already told them so. And the sea got rougher, and so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick up. Jonah says, pick me up, he replied, and it became calm. And you know, it is my fault that the great storm has come upon us. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm, because you know it's my fault. There is a great storm. Let us pray. Father God, Holy Spirit, Mother God, we thank you for this moment and this hour. Let it be edifying. Let it lift us up. Let us, let us hear your words. Let it penetrate our hearts and our spirits and our minds and our souls, that we may become your children in the flesh on this earth as we walk upon in our spiritual journey. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen? amen, amen. Graceful heart. And so Amanda, who sprung onto the scene in the inauguration, some of us may have known her before, but for the most part we did not know her name, and she sprung onto the scene in the inauguration of Biden and Harris stealing the show from everyone, every singer, every speaker, almost even Biden. For after we spoke about was Amanda Gorman, adorned with jewelry from Maya Angelou, who spoke words and rhythm and rhyme and movement. She took lines from Hamilton. She ended with the crescendo of kingly Dr. King, but she was eloquent only 22 years old, a poet, activist. She won the National Youth po Poet Laureate in 2017, Harvard University student, and the poem was called The Hill We Climb. The Hill We Climb. I'll take you to the first verse. When day comes, we ask ourselves, 
Where can we find light in this ever-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade in. We brave the belly of the beast. Of course, the imagery is that of Jonah. The day comes when we ask ourselves, when will we find light in this never-ever shade? The loss we carry, the sea that we must wade, and we bravely brave the belly of the beast. That is, when I thought about it, I realized what she was saying was that America is Nineveh and that we have turned our backs on Nineveh and America, that there is work to be done. And of course, Jonah, who was on the sea, the stormy sea, and here he is. Jonah is an interesting character in the Bible. We see him buying a ticket when God called him to speak to Nineveh because he knew that their wicked ways but what he knew was, you know that one word from God through your ears and it through your lips can change the world. If you knew that words from God through your ear and into your lips and out your mouth can change this world. And Jonah knew this. And so he said, why would I bless the people that I don't like? Why would I bless people that I don't care about? Why would I bless those despicable Ninevites? And I got to say, the Jonah complex is so prevalent today in this world. So many people have given up on people who have said, why should I speak to them? They're hopeless. Why should I speak to them? They won't listen to me. And we have gone the opposite direction. Do you realize what Jonah did? He bought a one-way ticket and went to Tarshish, which is 900 miles in the opposite direction. God says, go to these people and speak to these people. And Jonah says, I'm not speaking to those people, and I'm going 900 miles in the opposite direction. That is prevalent today. And so many people I hear, I can't talk to those people. I can't talk to those people and we have to speak to those people because Jonah shows us what happens when you don't speak to those people. For they were ready for ruin. They were ready. And so this sermon is about the truth about what we are called to do and what happens when we turn away and turn our backs on those people that we are to speak with. For the eloquence and the beauty of all of this that Amanda Gorman ca ca captured in her sermon, and I would say poetry, but the Jonah says we have to get out and help those people, even when we don't care about them, even when we don't like them, God has called us to take care of one another. And it's interesting because Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, and that the one that made the sea and the land. He knows God. He knows that God is powerful. He knows that God created the heavens and the earth. And yet, he refuses to speak to the people that God has chosen for him to speak to. For he is a worshiper, proud that he is a Hebrew, proud that he knows God, proud that he has his faith, and yet he is fleeing from the very people that God has told him to speak to. That tells us how fragile we are, how fragile we are. When we are called by God, we know the God of heaven and earth can move everything, and yet we refuse to speak. We refuse to use what God has given us to change this world. He is proud pedigree. He is proud of, his, of, his, of his, 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 all that he knows and what he knows, but he's missed the truth. He has missed the truth of God. He has missed the teachings, and he has missed the concerns of the God of heaven. How can you know God and yet not speak to God's people? How can you? This morning, we cannot take for granted God's people whether we like them or not, it is important that we take what we have 
and give to those who may not have heard the word and need to hear the word of God. For here's the clincher. God, Jonah knows God. God. Jonah knows the power of God. But let me just say this. When you have an enemy, sometimes you're like, why would I bless my enemies? Why would I want my enemies blessed? I know what God can do for them. Why would I do that? They're my enemies. I want them to suffer. I want them to be in pain. I want them to be in agony. But God is saying, those are my children. I remember a story when God, when the, when the children of the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea and they saw the Red Sea closing in on the Egyptians and they began to sh shout and celebrate. And God said, don't celebrate. Those are my children as well. Those are my children as well. So this morning we recognize in ourselves the Jonah complex. I don't want God blessing my enemies. Really? You know what God has done for you in your life. You know the power and the presence of the Spirit in your life, and yet you have withheld it from those who are around you. You have been reticent to not talk about it. Dorothy Day says she talks about God wherever she could because she knows the power of God in her lips and what he can do. If you know the power of God, why haven't you shared it with everybody you know? Because as the sailors on the ship, it says, never forget that only the dead fish swim with the stream. Malcolm Woodridge, he is a writer, a journalist, English. He is well known for his book on Mother Teresa and bringing Mother Teresa to the world's knowledge. And so through him, he has written many books, over 20 books, and he has some, one of his sayings is, never forget that only a dead fish swim with the stream. The church should never be swimming with the stream. God's people should never be swimming with the stream. We shouldn't be doing what everybody else is doing, especially when it's antithetical to what God wants us to do. And so we have to be swimming in a different direction, against the current, because there are so many people in your boat that you have left out. What about family members that need help? What about those who are need? We can't fit in. Because if we fit in, we will leave those behind who need our help. What about when this world turns materialistic and they're able to give GM clean water, but the people of God get dirty water? We have turned to materialism, and the church has to speak out against it. When we see nationalism overtake Christianity and everything else, we have to say, God is not Republican, God is not Democrat, God is so much higher than all of that that we should not be judging one another just because of one's belief. Amen? Amen. Because here it is, care us not that we perish. Care us not. The sailors said to Jonah, don't you care that we will perish? Don't you care? Don't you care? that we will perish. We are losing family members, co-workers. There are people in our community that we are losing. We are losing people because you haven't opened your mouth. Because God has spoken to you, he has given you the message, and you haven't spoken it. If we would only speak what God has given us, there are so many people more that we could save, family members, co-workers who are depressed and lost. Communities, we're losing kids, children, drug addiction, gun violence. If you were to say one thing and to save one life, what a difference that would make. What a difference that would make. We can't hold back any longer. Because let me tell you, there are some things that God doesn't care about. And let me tell you what they are. He doesn't care how you feel about the people he told you to go help. He doesn't care if you think they won't listen. He doesn't care if you think they are hopeless because he gave you 
a mandate and a commission to speak to those people that he has put in your purview. And so remember this, the Good Samaritan, after the rabbi has passed by, after the priest has passed by, somebody from a different tribe came by, and that's the person that helped. So often, Jesus has taught us to help people outside of who we are. The lady at the well, five husbands, and the one she was with was not her own. Jesus spoke to her and said, give me something to drink. To the Lazarus, he showed us at your gate how many times did the rich man drive by and leave him there. We can't continue to do this, church. This is what the complex of Jonah has done because it has showed us, as Amanda put it, just is isn't always justice. Just is. The way things are doesn't mean that justice exists. And we have to know that the arc of the universe, as Dr. King put it, is long, but it bends towards justice. And it is our work and our efforts to make sure that justice is felt everywhere and every place, that we penetrate it, because Jonah knew the God of heaven, but he didn't have it in his heart. Because if he had it in his heart, he would have known that the people of God were hurting and in pain. This is important this morning. For you must know that every creature, every creature on this planet has a spiritual longing. We all have a spiritual longing for something greater. We are spiritual beings, as we talked about last week. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual having a human experience. And so this morning, as we understand that we have a longing, all the it says all the sailors were afraid, and guess what? Every one of them called out to God. Their God, it says. Everybody has a need to worship something. This is a desire in our hearts, a deep longing, a deep yearning to claim something, whether you believe or you don't believe. That is your spiritual longing. Whether you believe or don't believe, that is your religious thoughts. And let me say this to somebody who said they fell out, they fell apart when the person they loved didn't love them back. And they said, I have no meaning, I have no purpose in life. You made that your religion. <laughs> that was your religion. Because whatever you believe in that gives you purpose, that gives you meaning, that's your religion. And so out of all the creatures on this earth, only human beings are the one that must live with a meaning and purpose. We must, we just can't get up every day like the cows and eat and chew cud. We can't do that. We are human beings who have to know that we have a meaning and we have a purpose. And so this morning, people who say they are not religious, they are religious. They are believing in something. And in Romans 1, Paul says we are homo sapiens, homo sapiens, we believe in something. And that's our prime drive. And that's the prime thing. We believe, even when you're in a foxhole. I'm recalling this story of a chaplain who worked in a hospital, and he, he talked to me one day, and he said, I got this call at 3 a.m. And this guy, the nurse said, I have to come down right now. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. I know it's early, but you got to come down, and you got to speak to this patient. He's in desperate need. Please come. And so the chaplain got dressed and, and went downstairs, and he went into the room, and the gentleman was like, I'm so embarrassed. I'm sorry to call you like this. But they had given me the charts that I was terminally ill, and then they realized they mixed up my charts with somebody else. And so I come to find out I'm okay. So I don't need God. And that's the reality that people are in, that we only need God when we're in trouble, that we only need God when the ships and the sails are torn and the ship is about to be overturned, and we say, oh, God, I need you now. But then as soon as things get nice and the weather is good and all smooth sailing, I'm good. I don't need you, God. See, this is the problem we face today that we have stopped believing in God because life got too good. It is said 
that human beings stop believing in God, they believe in nothing. The truth is much worse than that. They believe in anything. That's what we're seeing now. When you stop believing in God, you start believing in anything. And that's a dangerous curve that America is on. Because when we have a detached from the truth, detached from reality, then we, we are hooking up with some all kinds of crazy stuff we're hearing on the radio all week long. People believing that a laser started a wildfire. People believing that Sandy Hook didn't happen. People saying, well, 9-11 didn't happen either. It's a hoax. Where are these people getting this from? And if they're not believing in God, what are they believing in? That they have this information. And so this morning, when you stop believing in God, we are worshipers. we got to believe in something. And we're in a dangerous place. Because he also said, Malcolm Midridge, if God is dead, somebody is going to take his place. It will be a megalomania or erotomania, the drive for power or drive for pleasure, the clinching of the feasts, or the failures. Hitler or Hugh Hefner, which will you believe in? Which will you believe in? And that's the danger when we don't believe in God that we find something else to worship. And that's what we're seeing now on the national scenes. And it's so dangerous because nobody has your interest at heart like God. Nobody has your interest at heart like God. And so when we have the prayer and the prayer of terror that drives us to God, that's the start. But we got to continue with the relationship, continue praying, continue reading the Bible, continuing with our intimacy with God so that we get to know God truly for who God is to us. We begin to grow in the spirit. We begin to do the hard work. Your pastor can't do the work for you. I wish I could, but I cannot. You need to do your own work. Sunday ought to be a celebration and a praise for all the work you've done all week long. You can't expect one hour on a Sunday morning to combat the negativity that you face all week long. All week long. You have got to make sure that you're balancing the scales with some positive energy during the week. And however you do that, finding God throughout the week so that on Sunday morning, you get in here and you are a worshiper. And you're worshiping because you know you're celebrating that which you found. That's what you're seeking. And so it's interesting because all the sailors were afraid and each one cried out to their God. It was the impact of Jonah on the sailors and sailor on Jonah. For Jonah realized that he had to save the people finally. He realized that, but he also, they realized that his God was the God because they began praying to his God after all of this when they saw the sacrificial love of Jonah. And so this morning, as Amanda Gorman gave us and all who given us, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. What a place to be to say, you know what? It's my fault. The reason why people are suffering, it's my fault. And I can do something about it. If we were to take that moment to say, don't just look at those people, don't just look at those sinners, but to say, maybe I could help them. Maybe there's something I can do to help to put them on the right path. And so this morning, there is a clarion call. The clarion call, as our poet Amanda gave us, is to go back to Nineveh and go back to America where places that people are needing help. People are hurting. People are starving. And the clarion call is we can't turn our backs and go the other way. God is calling us this morning to make sure that we 
look for those people, even if we despise them, even if they think opposite of what we think. That's not important. What's important is they are God's children, and we must help them. Amen. And that is the importance this morning that Amanda used in her poet. Most people said it was from Hamilton. It's not from Hamilton. It's from the Bible, and it's Micah 4.4. It says that everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one, no one shall be afraid. George Washington carried this all the time with him to let everybody know that everybody ought to have their own vine tree and their own fig tree, and they will not be afraid. That we have to take our faith to the streets. We've got to take our faith to the public square, and they may not want to hear it. They, want, they, may, not think, they may think you're off your chain, you're, you've lost your mind, but guess what? Your responsibility is to God. It's to God. To remember that God has told you that these are the people you must help. And this is important because I'd have to say to you what the captain said to Jonah. How can you sleep? <laughs> How can you sleep in the midst of a storm? How is it you can sleep so well when people are hurting and people are dying? How can you sleep, Grace Church? How can you sleep, America? Dr. King talked a story about the Rip Van Winkle who fell asleep through the whole revolution. We cannot go through this moment asleep. The church cannot go through this moment asleep. So often the church has been asleep during times when it was needed most in this world. And if there's anyone that can bring this world together, it's through God's people preaching God's word a brother and sisterly love the beloved community. That is the only way we can come together. It is the fighting struggle because churches too often we fight over silly things. What color should the carpet be? I don't know. Should, did Adam have a belly button or not? We don't know. And I've seen churches break apart because one church said, no, we're not going to have a woman preacher. And they said, we want a woman preacher. And they would split up. One church split up. They didn't know who should get the building. So this is what they did. It was a brick building. They took all the bricks down, and they gave half brick to one congregation and all half to the other congregation. One went up the street and built the church, and the other one went down the block and built the church. This is the craziness that our churches have gone through today. We have got to find a way to work together because we are all God's children, and it only in the strength of the church, through the civil rights movement, it was the strength of the church that helped to put things through. Amen. And it is time we learn to work together again. Because it's important. So often we have put other things more important than people. When Jesus healed a man in, when Jesus healed a man in the synagogue with a withered hand, and the Pharisees said, how can you do that on a Sabbath? And he said, man was a maid. Man was, Sabbath wasn't made for the man. Man was made for the Sabbath, or all the way around. Sabbath was made for the man. You know which way it is. But the important thing is, it's not about the Sabbath. Right. It was about the man. Right. It was about the man. It was about the person. And Jesus so often teaches us, it's not about our rules and our regulations and our dogma and our doctrine. It is about the people and how are we helping the people. And so this morning, many of us who are wrapped up in our own pain, in our own hurt, in our own frustrations, cannot even see how other people are dying and how other people are lost. We can't even see it because we're so tied up in our own mess. We haven't got time to look at other people. But God is saying, I didn't give you what I gave you just for you. I gave it to you so that you could be a blessing to this earth so that you could bless others and take care of others. For Philippians says, we're to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. That yes, sometimes God calls us to do things that we're afraid of the unknown, but we know that God has called us to work it out in fear and trembling. And so this morning, 
We know that we are Christians, and we must love the downtrodden, the ugly, the smelly, the loveless. Guess why? Because that was us. That was us when we were out there and didn't know God. And now we know God, and we know what God has done for us, that he died on a cross for us, that he loved us that much, that he gave everything up. And because of that, it doesn't matter what Nineveh did, because we're just as guilty as Nineveh. And that ought to fill your heart with grace, that God loved you even though you were just as bad, just as wrong as Nineveh. And how can we judge somebody and say, I'm a Christian, you're not, and feel good about that? We're not Christian. We're not Christian because I walk around and say, I'm a Christian. They will know you're a Christian by your love, it says, and by the way you interact and take care of people. Because Jesus said, don't just love your family and your friends. He said, love your enemies. He said, pray for your enemies. We're to take care of those in a country that's divided. This is a message for us all, that we're not to just be good, moral people, but that, and looking down at others. That's not Christianity. Christianity means going out. What Jesus talked about when he first sermon, and he said, I've come for the brokenhearted. I've come for the blind. I've come for those who are in captured. I've come for those. And we must, as God's people, do the same. And so in this morning, your heart ought to be filled with grace. Ought to be filled with grace, knowing that I must speak to those even if I hate, despise, disbelieve everything that they say, it is time for us to bridge the divide, to make that place, because we've become superior in our nature because we think that because I know God and people don't, I got something over them. And you're supposed to use that for good. Use that for the people of God. Use your faith for what is required of us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And when you walk humbly with God, you could never say, look at those Ninevites, I would never help them. Look at those people, I would never help them. Because you humbly know that God has helped you. And where would you be? Because here it is. She ends her 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 epic, epic poem with this. When the day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. We can be that light. We are to be the light in the darkest of places because we're a reflection of the light that we know, the light that we have been exposed to. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we are brave enough to see it, but also brave enough to be it. Amen. I bless you, and I hope that you find that graceful heart that allows you to go out and touch this world in a profound way. Amen. Amen. Amen.